very sunny, crisp, almost wintry feeling day. The warmth of all of you here will contribute to, I think, a very glowing uh, event. I am Joyce Berkman, Joyce Average Berkman. I generally include my maiden name in my uh, formal self-presentations. Uh, and I have been, I was professor of US history with a primary concentration in US women and gender history for 48 years before I retired two years ago from the University of Massachusetts. Before I begin, um, I do want to mention that we plan to have questions and observations from all of you, and we, I strongly encourage you all to participate in the period of time we will have for that after the two presentations today. There are a number of people here who have had connections with Jane Adams in one way or another. Please share that after the, you know, the panel presentations. I also want to have us all recognize again what David did, and that is the remarkable dedication and passion that Rudd put into planning this and making this happen. He had the assistance, but in a way, he, was, he didn't just spearhead it. He single-handedly managed so many of the logistics involved in making this possible, especially this kind of conference. It was his vision to bring Jane Addams into the dialogue with today's issues not simply to view her as a figure in the past who did a lot of wonderful things, may have left a legacy, but who he wanted to incarnate today here to grapple with the questions that are before us in this very critical time in our nation and world's history. A word or two about my connection with Jane Addams, and then I will introduce our two wonderful speakers. Over four decades, I've taught U.S. women's history, and Adam's life represented for me an inspiring example of a complex, brilliant, pragmatic, and innovative thinker. And she also is a constant reminder of how women who were very progressive in their thinking, and women who even weren't progressive in their thinking, have been misrepresented, diminished, sidelined in the histories of our country. This is not to make a saint of her, to memorialize her as a goddess, which is what women's history has sometimes been attacked as doing. Very few practitioners of the trade do that. We see her as very human. But she was extraordinary. She was a pathbreaker in so many dimensions. And that that was marginalized till to this, even in this day, and so few people who know about her, as Rudd rightly noted, uh, is to me a, an issue of pain. And this has a lot to do with the way in which male centered history has dominated our profession for too many years. Fortunately, in the last several decades, there's been a return of interest in Jane Addams, and we are so fortunate today to have uh, Louise Knight, who has been guiding us into a much fuller and more complicated and widely dimensioned portrait of uh, Jane Addams. It should not surprise us, though, that a person who was a critic of capitalism, of nationalism, of globalization, who opposed unjust who championed immigrants, espoused racial, ethnic, gender, social justice, should have been pushed to the sides, even by many women scholars. She was a complicated figure, and she doesn't stand clearly in one place or another in terms of easy ideological categories. During the 1970s and 80s, I worked on a figure called, by the name of Olive Schreiner, who I doubt any of you know here, and maybe a few of you do. She was the leading figure in South Africa, and many of the same causes that engaged Jane Addams. They met. They met in London in 1915, during World War I, shortly after Jane Addams had been at The Hague, uh, and 
together they shared their views that ultimately was all part of Jane Addams' decision to uh, internationalize the women's movement that had begun in the United States and to help uh, develop the Women's League, International League for Peace and Freedom. Since our conference handouts include biographic information on today's speakers, I won't spend a great deal of time introducing you to these distinguished speakers, but at the cost of some repetition from what you can read, I'm eager to hail these women orally and publicly. Our keynote speaker for this entire conference, Louise W. Knight, holds the position since 2010 of visiting scholar in the Gender and Sexuality Study Program at Northwestern University. I met Louise when she was a research fellow at our Five College Women's Studies Research Center at Mount Holyoke during fall semester 1996. At this point, she was preparing the first of her two books on Jane Addams, as well as preparing an array of essays and public presentations about Addams. Her first publication, I mentioned it before, Citizen, Jane Addams and the Struggle for Democracy, published in 2005, examines the origins of, of Addams' philosophical and activist ideals and political values. It gives you a strong sense of the beginnings. Her second study, Jane Addams' Spirit in Action, published in 20, I have the wrong, 2010, thank you, offers us a compelling full life biography and marks Knight as the premier biographer of Addams. Her most recent talks and her forthcoming book focus on the lives of the early 19th century abolitionists and feminists, the sisters Sarah and Angelina Grimke, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux expect to release this book, American Sisters, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, and the first fight for human rights, predecessors of Jane Addams. And they, it's 2020? 2020. 2020, so we need to be a little patient. Our next speaker, Kathy Moran Hajo, is responsible for current and future studies on the life and writings of Jane Addams. Since 2015, Kathy holds the position of Assistant Professor of History and Director of the Jane Addams Papers Project at Rumble College of New Jersey. She directs and edits a project designed to publish in both digital and print editions the correspondence and writings of Jane Addams from 1901 to 1935. Kathy was amply prepared to take on the directorship of this project. She had years of experience in preparing, along with several others, the papers of Margaret Sanger for digital use, that's how I came to know her first. And Kathy has lectured and published widely on archival issues in our digital world. Hajo's book on birth control clinics in the United States from 1916 to 1940, published in 2010, is indispensable reading for anyone interested in both the access and actual experience of those involved with the illegal clinics at that time. This book is, has a practical, if you will, Jane Addams orientation to people as both creators and creatures of history. So it's my pleasure to turn over uh, the rest of the panel now, and beginning with Louise Knight. It's a little better that way, but uh, I don't. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Well, then we'll we'll do this. We'll do it this way. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Joyce, for the very kind and generous introduction, and thank you all for coming today. As you can imagine, there's nothing I like better than to celebrate Jane Addams. <laughs> I don't get to do it very often, and of course, the reason we're doing it is because of Rutherford Platt whose uh, incredible persistence, creativity, and vision made this all happen without a doubt. He refused to give up, and he did not give up. And so here we are. I also want to thank uh, the Massachusetts Humanities Council and Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice for co-sponsoring this forum. And, I, and as I said, uh, it's exciting for me to have people in the room who want to know more about Jane Addams. 
Adams, of course, as has been mentioned, lived a long time ago. Born in Northern Illinois in 1860, just before the Civil War began, she died in Chicago in 1935 in the middle of the Great Depression. A Midwesterner her entire life, by the time of her death, she was not only a national and international leader of progressive causes, she was also the most famous woman in the United States, and I sort of suspect possibly in the world. It is quite difficult to describe Jane Addams in a sense, because she had so many facets, and some of that has been hinted, but I'll run through a few again. Understandably, different people emphasize different aspects of her work. Some call her a humanitarian to emphasize her interest in the challenges people in poverty face. Some call her the founder of the American Settlement House movement to emphasize that she co-founded the nation's first settlement house, Hull House in Chicago, and led it for more than 40 years, and also that she was a leader of the national movement. Some call her a founder of the field of social work to emphasize that in creating and leading Hull House, she provided educated young people a means to learn about the challenges that working people faced, and also to emphasize that settlement volunteers launched many of the kinds of activities that became central to the social work profession. Some call her progressive to emphasize her interest in democratic policies, including those dealing with immigration and refugees, women's suffrage, union rights, the minimum wage, and the end of child labor. Some call her a civil rights advocate to emphasize her commitment to racial justice and free speech through her roles as a co-founder and longtime board member of both the NAACP and the ACLU. Some call her a feminist to emphasize her decades of work for women's equality. And she did that not only through women's suffrage, but also as the founding president of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Some call her a public intellectual to emphasize her prominent place in the debates of her times through her hundreds of speeches around the nation, her many published articles, and her 11 books. And some call her a pacifist to emphasize her long-standing belief in nonviolence, her national and international work for Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, her writings on peace, and her place in history as the first American woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. So in sum, you might call Jane Addams a Renaissance woman when it came to social and political action. It was rare for her times, uh, and it is perhaps even rarer today, when leading social activists, paid and unpaid, are likely to specialize. There are advantages to both approaches, and it might be interesting to discuss that later. I have wondered why Addams took up so many different issues, and I think there are perhaps three reasons. First, she had a broadly, the broadly curious mind of a true humanist. During lively midnight debates at Hull House, her friends tended to stake out their disparate viewpoints, while Adams, in the words of one friend, said, uh, said, they described her as uh, reacting with completely suspended judgment. Another said, she was always in that listening attitude of mind, of asking herself, what is this? This open-mindedness meant she listened and learned from everyone about everything. Second, she was head of Hull House, which was a generalist organization. Within the walls of its 13 buildings, every social question of the day arose, both in terms of personal experience and as something that needed fixing. Specialized organizations grew out of Hull House, but Hull House itself, under Adams' leadership, remained what we would call today an incubator. Third, Adams believed in cooperation. What I mean is not just that she thought it a good idea to cooperate, we all do, right? But she, what she meant was that it was the core, or what I mean by saying that, is that it was the core philosophy shaping her social justice work. Of these three reasons for Adams' embrace of many issues, I think the most important was her belief in cooperation. Contained within it were her Christian commitment to nonviolence and her democratic belief in social equality. She was not sure how to put these ideas in action, however, and these were the ideas that she settled on in her searching 20s, uh, until the year before she started Hull House when she visited the world's first settlement house, Toynbee Hall in London. Toynbee Hall's founders, Samuel and Henrietta Barnett, were, like Adams, Christians committed to nonviolence. 
They had a motto. The motto was, with, not for. With, not for. That is, cooperation. In, the settlement, in their settlement efforts, the Barnetts sought to work alongside working class people on the issues they, not the Barnetts, thought should be addressed. At Hull House, Adams tried to do the same. At today's forum, we'll be thinking about three sets of issues. And I should add that I'm not going to go into her biography, the rest of her biography now. I'm not going to talk about her father. I'm not going to talk about her rural upbringing, even though they're great subjects. But I'll be happy to answer questions in the discussion. So I'm going to focus on the three sets of issues that we're thinking about today at this forum. And these are all close to Adams's heart. Immigration and refugees, social and environmental justice, and peace. So I thought I would talk a bit about Adams' work on these issues, while also highlighting what you might call her methods, the way she worked. I will talk about Adams' work very mindful of the fact that uh, our times are, of course, in some ways quite different from the 46 years when Adams was active as an advocate, the years from 1889 to 1935. In fact, Adams thought a lot about what was called in her day the spirit of the times. And she thought about how the spirit of her times changed during her life. At the end of my talk, I will share some of her insights about that, and I hope we can also talk about the spirit of our times. So, immigra immigration and refugee issues. Adams lived, as we live now, during a series of decades when the United States policies towards immigrants <coughs> shifted dramatically. When she and her friend Ellen Gates Starr opened Hull House in 1889 in Chicago, the nation's door was wide open to immigrants, uh, I mean to Europeans, because their labor was needed for burgeoning factories. Um, though for other reasons, uh, on the West Coast, the door was closed to the Chinese. Uh, the door closed some more in the early 1900s, especially to Southern Europeans, for there was a great deal of prejudice about that category. Finally, in the 1920s, the door clanged virtually shut because the nation had become paranoid about the dangers immigrants posed. This fear was partly in the wake of the warmongering of World War I and partly in response to the terrorism of the day. After the war ended, self-described immigrant anarchists from Europe and Russia set off bombs in the United States that killed people. Terrorism and immigration restrictions have always gone together. Jane Addams and her friend Ellen Gates Starr knew virtually nothing about immigrants or their lives when they moved into the house they called Hull House in late 1889. They chose the house because they wanted to provide a welcoming place to immigrants, and the house was located in a 70% immigrant neighborhood. It was an industrial district where the workers also lived. It was obviously low income, the rents were low, and the conditions therefore were lousy because the um, people in the buildings didn't want to fix them up. Uh, so the people that lived there represented 23 nationalities. And there wasn't a whole lot of regional clumping. There was some, but there was, it was more by building than by section of the neighborhood. So it was fairly integrated, as we might say. Adams and Starr knew immigrants were, looking, were looked down upon by more prosperous Americans. And this seemed wrong to them, very anti-democratic. Hull House soon became that welcoming place. Neighbors came for social clubs and classes to leave their children for daycare, for lectures on socialism, for music concerts, to attend dances, to sing in the choir and act in the theater. Their labor unions sometimes met there, and they invited Adams and others to their homes, and she invited them to hers. Adams learned a great deal from these new social ties. But perhaps the most important thing that was, was what she learned about the gifts immigrants brought to American democracy. When she arrived at Hull House, she had not understood that. Having earned a college degree, she thought education was the best preparation for being a citizen, both in the political sense and in the sense of organizing to advance social justice. And since hardly any of the immigrants in her neighborhood had much education, she assumed they had limited abilities as citizens. She soon learned otherwise. In those days, male immigrants gained the vote easily within months of arriving, it was very simple. Um, and that was so their votes could be bought by the 
corrupt local government. Uh, this fact made them interested in politics. In addition, many men, as well as women, became active in struggling labor unions. Watching, Adams concluded that what a citizen in a democracy most needed was a sense of his own moral power and a willingness to exercise it. And these were the things most people had. As she put it, all kinds of people have reservoirs of moral power and civic ability in themselves. Living in an international community, Adams also gave much thought to the question of ethnic, racial, and na national identities. She made sure that Hull House was a space where diverse people could celebrate their cultures, even as they also came to learn English as a second language. At Hull House, the Greeks from the neighborhood, for example, performed a play by Aeschylus in the original Greek, vastly impressing the classics professors from the University of Chicago, <laughs> whom Adams had insisted attend. She was very proud of that. Uh, and she understood the pride African Americans took in their culture and the injustice of racial prejudice. She considered the racism whites felt towards African Americans to be, in her words, the gravest situation in American life. Uh, at the same time, she did not see a contradiction between honoring group identities and honoring everyone's common identity as human beings. She thought that both kinds of identities needed recognition at the same time. The issue came into sharp focus for her around the question of patriotism. Here is what she said, writing about Chicago. In the modern city, composed of people brought together from all the nations of the earth, patriotism must be based not upon a consciousness of homo homogeneity, but upon a respect for variation. It must be based not upon inherited memory, but upon trained imagination. And I'd love to talk a bit more about what she meant by trained imagination, because it's a very interesting idea. You'll have to figure it out. <laughs> At the same time, she believed that democracy's health required Americans to identify with each other as fellow human beings. Thus she wrote, the city must avoid those limited loyalties and that sense of restricted obligation, which may prove so disastrous to the common good. Today, communities provide essential services to new immigrants, just as Hull House did. And here um, in Western Mass, you have the Center for New Americans. Today, churches invite new refugee immigrants to live in their communities, as Edwards Church and College Church do through their support for the Refugee Resettlement Project. Today, individuals welcome immigrants into their own lives, as my friend Sue Alexander of Leverett, right here, has done. She is now the beloved grandmother of an extended Cambodian-American family right here in Pioneer Valley. And today, organizations fight to protect the legal rights of immigrants, as Mass ACLU does, most notably through its recent successful state court case blocking ICE from forcing local officials to detain people at its request. When people and churches and organizations do these things, they are doing what our democracy calls for and that Adams believed was essential. Honoring the immigrant as both a person with strong connections to his or her native culture and as a human being. We need to be able to do both. There is no contradiction here. Second subject today is social and environmental justice. I tried to figure out what I could say about Adams on environmental justice. The main issue was garbage. And she worked very hard on the issue. Uh, in fact, it was the issue that drew her into politics at the local level. You won't be surprised here. However, um, it's a long, complicated story, so I'm not going to talk about it right now, but I'm happy to talk more about it during the discussion. I'm going to move on to social justice uh, as the sort of second theme here. Social justice issue of Adam's time was first and foremost the badly trampled rights of working people. Living as she did in an industrial district, she immediately began to learn about their lives, how poorly they were paid, how many hours they worked, sometimes as many as 12 hours a day how dangerous and unhealthy their working conditions were, how often they were laid off, how early they put their children to work, how much they wanted to be good providers for their families, and how difficult it was. The situation was clearly unjust. Working people's issues became the issues which Jane Addams was most devoted to. They were the basis of her lifelong work for social justice, including 
not just her work on immigration rights and labor organizing rights and the minimum wage and social security, but also some other causes that you don't think of as working people's causes, but she did. Civil rights, free speech, women's suffrage, that's how she got into it, was getting working women the vote, and peace, because it's the working people who go out and fight. In Adam's day, most urban working people, whether men, women, or children, worked in factories or home-based sweatshops. Therefore, the obvious way to improve their lives was to increase their wages, shorten their working hours, and improve their working conditions. Adams had led a sheltered life, so when she arrived at Hull House, she naively supposed she only needed to ask their employers to make things right. And I think it was because her father employed people and he was a good guy. Um, but she soon learned otherwise. A child she knew who worked at a local can candy, candy factory and attended activities at night at Hell House was killed by a machine that did not have a guard on its blade. She asked the employer to install a guard, but he refused. He actually said, there's more children where that one came from. From this and other experiences, Adams realized that working people were right. Employers only cared about profits. Working people needed labor unions to fight for their rights, starting for their right to organize. Adams' involvement with the labor movement began with a with, not for, moment. Her first spring at Hull House, she invited a young bookbinder, Mary Kenny, who was trying to organize a union, to dinner at Hull House. Kenny and her fellow women bookbinders worked 11-hour days, five days a week, and a 10-hour day on Saturdays. They wanted to strike for a shorter work day. Kenny was unsure what to think of Adams and her motives. She arrived at Hull House feeling distinctly uncooperative. Adams invited her to sit next to her at the dining room table and said, what can we do with each other for the girls in your trade? Kenny asked her if the bindery union could meet at Hull House, and Adams said yes. Kenny asked her if she would pay for printing the flyers announcing the meeting, and Adams said yes. And then she offered to distribute the flyers in the neighborhood herself. Kenny's resistance melted. She wrote later, when I saw there was someone who cared enough to help us and to help us in our own way, it was like having a new world open up. The partnership the two women formed that day continued for many years. In 1903, 13 years after they first met, Adams and Kenny, along with some friends of theirs from other parts of the country, women settlement leaders and trade union organizers, founded uh, the Women's Trade Union League. The WTUL was the first national body dedicated to organizing and supporting women workers, workers that the American Federation of Labor refused after a few very weak attempts to organize. As a matter of policy, the majority of the WTUL national board were women trade union organizers. The rest were women like Adams who were called allies. When the WTUL supported a strike, the allies' job was to raise money present a classy image to the press, and bail strikers out of jail. The organizers took care of the strike. There are organizations now like Community Action of Greenfield, Northampton, and Orange, which requires that one third of its board live with lower, who live with low, um, that one third of their board be people who are living with low incomes to ensure that they have a direct voice in shaping the organization's policies and programs. The list of those programs is, therefore, strikingly similar to the daily activities that took place at Hull House, reflecting what the people want and need and ask for. There are organizations like Western Mass Jobs for Justice, which fights for workers' rights to form and join unions and fight for their rights, the same rights at stake in Adam's Day, for decent pay, for safe working conditions, and for a working day that allowed for a certain amount of time for family and leisure. These organizations are acting on the same wisdom Adams slowly gained during her early years at Hull House. The third issue, peace. My subject, my third subject is peace. Do we have some Wilfers here? Any Wilfers? Thank you for putting up your hands. Wilf is the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. It was founded in 1915, months after World War I began, by an international group of women, including Jane Adams who believed that citizens of countries of war could respect and listen to each other and that women should participate in efforts to achieve peace. The 1,100 women who met at The Hague in 1915 were delegates from 12 European, European countries 
some of whom were currently at war. Uh, and also delegates from the United States, which at that time was still a neutral nation. Adams had just been elected president of the newly formed Women's Peace Party, so she headed the American delegation. She told a reporter as she boarded the boat in New York, we do not think we can make the army cease slaughter. We do think it is valuable to state a new point of view. We do think it is fitting that women should meet and take counsel to see what may be done. The meetings resulted in a new organization called the International Committee of Women for Permanent Peace, of which Adams was elected president. The body adopted a set of resolutions endorsing certain principles of international law, the creation of an international court and an international legislature, and the requirement that people, women be included in the decision making in, on all aspects of peace and security. Adams closed the stirring conference with these words. Our protests may be feeble, but the world progresses only in proportion to the moral energy exerted by the men and women living in it. Social advance must be pushed forward by the human will and understanding united for conscious ends. The International Committee met again in 1919 at the end of the war and renamed itself the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. It also adopted a revised set of resolutions that not only called for women's participation in bodies dealing with peace and security questions, but also for laws establishing women's equality, including suffrage and also racial equality. As one of its leaders later wrote, only when freedom is secure is permanent peace possible, and only when women are free will they be real workers for peace. Wilkes was quite possibly, I haven't researched this, the first truly international peace organization. There's lots that claim the title, but they mean just Europe, <laughs> or Europe of the United States. Um, they actually had delegates from 50 nations attending the 1919 meeting. Uh, it was held in Zurich. The organization set up its international office in Geneva, where the new, way too modestly conceived <coughs> League of Nations was headquartered, and worked intensely with that body during the 1920s and early 1930s to advance disarmament treaties until such efforts were defeated by the drumbeat of renewed war. Today, as we all know, the international peace movement has grown impressively, aided by the successful founding of the stronger United Nations and the creation of its Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Most strikingly, the United Nations Security Resolution 1325, adopted in the year 2000, contains many of the provisions found in Wills 1919 resolutions. I've done a chart comparing them, it's quite fascinating. Including the requirement that women be part of decision making for peace and security. <clears throat> Today the, the work for peace continues. Right here in the Pioneer Valley, you have the Tra Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice, which includes in its mission an emphasis on peace education and peace leadership, which is something that Wilf was very focused on as well. And Wilf continues his work. In the United States, there are some 40 branches including the Central and Western Massachusetts branch. There is a US section office and a New York office. Worldwide, it has member organizations in 39 nations, from Albania to Zimbabwe. It works on disarmament, human rights, women, peace and security, and environmental issues arising from war. The daunting project of disarmament is also carried forward today by key Wolf partners. The group Physicians for Social Responsibility received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for its work on nuclear weapons. Its offshoot ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, just won, as you know, the Nobel Peace Prize this year. Remarkably, ICANN mobilized more than 400 NGOs from 100 countries to lobby the United Nations to adopt an international ban against nuclear weapons. The UN adopted that ban in July. Much work remains to activate the ban. And if Jane Addams were alive today, I have no doubt she would be working with others to persuade those 50 nations to sign the treaty, at which point it will go into force. I said at the beginning that Adams' commitment to cooperation grew out of her Christian belief in nonviolence and her democratic belief in social equality. These were the ideals with which she started. As she practiced cooperation, she learned more about what it meant to truly cooperate. She learned she needed to be willing to set aside the desire for personal accomplishment. Adams wrote that the individual 
must be willing to lose a sense of personal achievement and be content to realize his activity only in connection with others. She also learned she needed to be willing to compromise her ideals. Adams wrote, the man who moves with the people may often compromise his best convictions. He has to discover what the people really want. She learned she needed to be willing to be patient with her fellow human beings. Adams wrote, moral results are often obtained through the most unexpected agencies. It is very easy to misjudge the value of an undertaking by an unfair estimate of the temperament and ability of those undertaking it. So he's very gentle. Uh, she, I'm sure she had a specific few people in mind. <laughs> Finally, she learned she needed to be willing to feel a ready affection for all the people with whom she came into contact. One of Adams' favorite sayings adapted from Tolstoy was this. We constantly think that there are circumstances in which human beings can be treated without affection, and there are no such circumstances. By affection, she meant something we might translate as a spontaneous spirit of generous respect. With all this talk of cooperation, I have perhaps left you with the impression that Adams was mostly a follower, but that would be decidedly wrong. Her conscience was her ultimate guide, and she understood that at certain moments, an individual had the responsibility to lead. As she once said, using our life as a moral principle, there is nothing we cannot do with it. After the searing experience of World War I, when many Americans hated her for her pacifism, she wrote, a man's primary allegiance is to his vision of the truth, and he is under obligation to affirm it. Toward the end of her life, she wrote, progress is not automatic. The world grows better because people wish that it should and take the right steps to make it better. If things are ever to move forward, someone must be willing to take the first steps and assume the risks. That said, Adams was aware that we all should be, um, as we all should be, that one's ideas need to evolve, that one's thinking needs to change over time. She wrote, our ideas have to march along with events. And when events show that some of our grand ideals have failed, then we must adapt our democracy to meet those affairs. We must stretch our idealism to see deeper and wider. As she grew older, she was blunter about people avoiding an unexamined loyalty to ideas they grew up with. At 70, she wrote, wisdom does not necessarily accompany old age. Unless, <laughs> unless it achieves an understanding of the changing times. At the core of Adam's understanding of the spirit of the times lay her focus on what the people felt was urgent, what the society as a whole was feeling, not just a small and powerful elite. Adams wrote, premature reforms fail. Doctrinaire reforms fail. Reforms to be effective must be rooted in and routed through social consciousness. To me, this quotation highlights the broadest meaning of her theory of cooperation. It also stresses her belief in the need for fresh thinking and realism in the pursuit of social justice. Most of all, in these words, we hear her deep devotion to the people and to democracy. So the the um, oh, is it my All right, is that better? <laughs> the papers project is a documentary editing project, and what we do is we complete we're we are completing a book series called the Selected Papers of Jane Addams, and there are a couple of uh, the volumes on the back of the table there if you want to have a look at them. This uh, project was begun by Mary Lynn Bryan, and uh, 
she, she basically finished the first three volumes, and we are going to do the second three. Our books are covering 1901 until her death in 1935. So I, I like to think that we got the interesting half of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly interesting. Yeah. But, uh, but who reads books anymore? Um, one of the challenges for uh, editors is to bring the documents and the history to the people, and, and books are not really the best way to do it anymore. So what we decided to do is to publish a digital edition of Jane Addams' papers. And uh, we're including her letters, her articles, speeches, and other writings, but not her books. <laughs> um, when we're finished, we're going to have about 24,000 documents online and freely available to the public. And uh, so the, the goal of this is to democratize access to her papers. Um, and currently, to use these kinds of papers, you need to be able to go to an archive or get a, a, a one of 30 sets of microfilm in a research archive that has a microfilm reader anymore. So they're not, they're not terribly accessible, um, and our goal is to, to change that. We have a staff of three editors who work at the project, and we have 15 undergraduate students. And I think this is one of the things that is different about our project than others, is we're trying to use this as a, a kind of lab for students to learn about history at a really nitty gritty level. Um, so despite the fact that most of the students, you know, they, they don't know a ton about Jane Addams. They know that they, don't, they might know Hull House, they might know Peace. Uh, I like to think that they, they do know that she's not the wife of John Adams. Which <laughs> 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 a bar that some people do not um, But what's interesting to me is to see how they are reacting to the Adams documents. They are, you know, what we do is we actually pull each document up and we describe it in pretty detailed kind of topics and subjects. And, describing it to, to a general audience. And we also transcribe every document. So the students actually try to read Jane Addams' handwriting, <laughs> which is a challenge. Um, and they learn, you know, they, they, it, there's something to be said for reading things at this very detailed level where you really focus on the words and what they're trying to say. And um, because Addams' handwriting is so difficult, uh, we find that the, the transcription is probably one of the most important things that we're doing for the project. Because if a, a grammar school student wants to use Jane Addams' papers, She's not going to be able to read the handwriting. If even a high school or college student want to read Jane Addams' papers, they're going to have a difficult time with it. So making it accessible both by searching it and by being able to read the document on the screen is, the, to me, one of the most important things we're doing. Um, but the, it, it's an interesting way of learning about history because you're learning one letter at a time. And I think that students are really learning. Um, you know, they're seeing things as not like a, just a one sweeping statement, like, oh, yeah, the U.S. went into war, you know. They went in and everybody switched over and everybody was all on top of for it. No. <laughs> As they read these letters, they say, no, 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 that is not what happened. Um, I think they find it easier to make connections between what goes on now and what is going on back then because they're really reading it at this, this kind of detailed level. I think that uh, one of the things in the early years that we worked on that students found most um, touching was the, uh, the, the integration issues. And part of it's because what's going on in all the colleges, you know, a lot of their, their friends are back of students and their, you know, immigration means a lot to them right now. But for students that had Italian or Greek roots and who had considered themselves Americans through and through, to find out how unwelcome their great grandparents were. And it, it's really shocking to them. They, they, they make that connection very quickly because they start saying, I see the same kinds of things that are being said about the Greek and Italian immigrants in Jane Addams' day are the same things we're saying about immigrants now. They're just from different places. So it becomes a, a real kind of teachable moment where you, you talk about it. it's It's not about the person that people are trying to keep out. It's more about what they're trying to keep, you know, what, what people here don't want to see. Um, so I think that it, uh, Al Adams' arguments for these kind of eloquent about what America should be, what the, the variety of cultures should be here, they bring very true, very present to people today. And I think uh, the other issue that I've, we've come across is we we are now in the in the early years of, of World War One at the Adams Papers, <laughs> where, where we live in a bubble. It's 19, 1915 right now, uh, where all the students are, are reading and typing those documents. And uh, there was one document that we we it's actually going to be the last document in Volume Four that we're going to be working on. And it's a December 1913 article called The Peace on Earth. And in it, you know, Adams talks about the power of international arbitration, about how the 20th century is going to be this, um, this time of brotherhood and everyone getting together. 
Um, she talks about the, how the cost of maintaining armies and military takes funds from domestic programs that could help uh, provide health care and funds to prevent diseases, and argues that you know, all men are going to be brothers and interdependence, international discussion is going to be the way of the future. And uh, I mean, it, it, when you first hear it, you think, oh, that is really naive in December of 1913. <laughs> you know, she had no idea what was, what was going to come next. And one of our staff uh, was using a, a Game of Thrones reference, and he said, he was like, oh, Adam, she's such a sweet summer child. You know, she has no knowledge of you know, the way the world really works. And to me, the irony of a 20-something-year-old boy telling him to say Adams was naive was, was actually something I did not tell him about. But, uh, <laughs> But what they, they don't expect to find is that, uh, because, because they don't learn about the, the, the actual fight for peace, if you want to call it that, is what happens after the war begins. And, uh, you know, it, Adams is, is arguing for quite strenuously and for a long time and building a coalition of people who don't want America to enter the war and want the, the war to be ended, you know, by negotiation. And so they're reading day by day this, uh, this kind of analysis of how she's gathering people to the cause and the kinds of arguments they're making, the, the, the variety of people that are trying to stop the war and are not interested in the, the whole you know, kind of rock off thing. And I think that they see that, that you, can, you, know, you can fight against things that you, that you don't believe in that happening. I think it helps to inspire them to see that there are, you know, that you don't just passively accept what's happening in, the, in your society. You can, you can do something and you can change it. And one of the other aspects that I think uh, about her work that Louise touched on is, is how she was a collaborator. And she cooperated with a, such a broad global network of, of like-minded people. And one of the things that we're doing with our digital edition, which I've been thinking is turning into a much more exciting thing than we originally thought it would be, is we are trying to identify every person that is mentioned in, a, in an Adams document. So every person that wrote her a letter, every person that she wrote to, and every person that is mentioned in a letter is getting a short little bi biography on our site, and they're getting the links to all the documents that are made up. Um, and so what we're doing, you know, we, we kind of realized, is we're, we're constructing, or really reconstructing, her social network. We're building a, a, a kind of this broad idea of the, the, all the different people that she worked with, that she discussed, the, the people that were important in her life. And uh, we know that she wasn't a lone performer, um, and, but her philosophy meant that she collaborated with many other people. And the, the, uh, the, the network is extensive. Um, I always see it as that she, she has this view of neighborhood. And in the beginning, the neighborhood is the 19th floor of Chicago. And then the neighborhood becomes larger, it becomes the city, and then it becomes the state of Illinois, and then it becomes the nation, and then by the end, it's the whole world. And the idea is that you, know, you would treat you treat everyone in the world as your neighbor. Um, and I think that uh, that comes across in the kinds of people that she's working with and the ways that she works with them. Uh, so revealing this kind of a aspect of her life is something that I, I think our digital edition is uniquely able to do because it's not like just printing a list of names. It's beginning to work with the uh, nationality. Sorry, <laughs> that's my right. It's, it's being able to work the connections between them. So we will have a list of all the people who are in the suffrage organization, and then you'll have the peace organization, and you'll be able to see which ones of them are also involved, so that there's these interconnecting webs of progressives who are working on all these different issues. And it builds a kind of, uh, almost like a living web around which Adams is in the center. And you can see all the different ways and all the different lives that she's working with. Um, so in a little over two years of work, we've already identified 4,500 uh, different people and 650 organizations that come up in Adams' documents. And, uh, <laughs> and we're not even halfway through. <laughs> so you know, some of the things that we do is we, we kind of pour through the census records and passport applications and newspaper articles trying to figure out who these people were. Um, we, we find full house residents, we find Chicago neighbors of hers and union leaders. Um, the anarchists that she talks about in some of her speeches. Um, then there's a club women who fund the work of Hull House. Um, you know, we've got the Progressive Party grassroots movements and uh, people that, that don't have biographies written about them become very important in her life. And I think you know, people like Frances Keller in the Progressive Era. You know, you, you start to find that there were many people doing these things. It wasn't just Adams, it was a whole network of people 
And I think that our project helps to, to pull that out, even though we focus on Adams. Everyone else is a big part of it. Uh, and while many of her collaborators were women, it's been really interesting to see how many men were engaged in the kind of work that we're doing. I mean, I think people tend to compartmentalize figures. You know, Adams is women's history. Um, you know, no, she's not. <laughs> and you can tell that by how many, the kinds of people that she was associated with. Um, there's politicians and college faculty members and social workers all working together. And uh, in the center of it, there's Adams, you know, and you see how she interacts, how she interacts with the neighbors as well as, you know, world leaders and presidents. It's, it's, she treats everyone the same kind of way. Um, so I think that, you know, both the scholarly editing and the digital humanities work we're doing are collaborative, and it takes a team to build it. And we really feel like the project that we're getting in is, is making, um, we're, we're bringing the documents out to the public, and we're hoping that more and more people will use them and be inspired by them. Um, so I've got, there's some postcards in the back that have the, the website and everything that we're working on. Our current project is just getting the documents up and then we want to hopefully start to use them for a variety of different things. And uh, I think that it's really interesting to see history through a single person's papers and through their eyes. Um, you, you start to see lots of different things and you have an idea, you have the ability to agree with her or disagree with her because we're just presenting her words as they are. Um, you know, sometimes I ask myself, would Jane have to be happy with what we're doing? And uh, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> she was a very private person, and she, she burned many of her letters, and I think she, she was probably right to, <laughs> because I'm publishing all the others that I can find. <laughs> but uh, I do think that once she you know, got over her not wanting everyone reading her mail, I think that she would approve, because what we are doing is bringing you know, that kind of nitty gritty, how you get things done in the world, back to the, to, to everyone, to, to be able to see. So, thank you very much. Before we begin the uh, questions, observations, and discussions, uh, Rudd just alluded to the fact that you all should know, if you want to study this period, and particularly Jane Addams, that at the University of Massachusetts, the W.E.B. E. Du Bois papers are all there for uh, looking into that connection with the founding of the NAACP, and that at the Smith College and the archives there, which are in somewhat transition as the library is being totally redone, are the Ellen Starr papers. And so that would be another source for you or students or others you know who want to pursue this period of uh, Jane Addams' life. Uh, I will take the privilege of being a moderator to open with a question, and then I hope you are digesting all the wonderful information that has been imparted to think of what questions you would like to ask, what observations. And my question is to the both panelists, perhaps mostly to Louise. Early on in women's history, we learned that women figures like Jane Addams didn't do it alone. They had support networks. They had key figures in their life, that the personal is the political. And it would be helpful, I think, maybe for the audience here to know what empowered Jane Addams. We know she was had Christian and, and social democratic visions and ideology, but there are real people who are instrumental in the cooperation and collaboration, but really in strengthening Jane Addams to pursue this phenomenal career. Sure, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Joyce. Um, this is actually why you write biographies, <laughs> is to really answer questions like that. So I'm just going to pick out a few people because obviously every every one of us is empowered by more than one person in our lives. Her father was a very important influence on her life. She devote a whole chapter of her memoir to him, and he was her hero. Uh, he was a politician of the most ethical sort. Uh, the next person was a, a professor, a teacher at Rockford Seminary, which was a, became a college, it wasn't theological, they just called it the seminary because that was education. Uh, and she really supported Jane Ann's desire to learn how to speak in public. She picked that, picked that up in college through uh, um, informal activities, clubs and things, and this professor led those and encouraged Jane Addams to write. So, and these, having sort of a 
father who's a role model and a professor in college who says, acquire these skills that women aren't supposed to have. Uh, that's very empowering, and uh, so I'm sure that's essential. So the, the missing piece for me, and then of course, Toynbee Hall was the belief of the Barnetts and Jane Addams when they met her um, and said, yes, go do this, you can do it. Uh, that was very important to her. because she Not only did she have a role model in what they did, and uh, that was very, she, Hull House was really closely modeled on Toynbee Hall, except that it was for all men and hers was co-ed. But um, she also had these two founders who believed in her. She was 29, 28, 29 years old, and that meant a lot too. Um, but then I think the most important person in terms of sort of the next notch up for Adams in terms of empowerment was Florence Kelly. Because Florence Kelly, uh, I was fascinated to do this research to figure out how much had Florence Kelly done before she arrived at Hull House. She needed to move to the state of Illinois to get a divorce um, and protect her children from her abusive husband. And networking brought her to Hull House as an inexpensive social justice kind of place, but really, there was nothing political going on at Hull House at that time. It was 1892, and Adams had never crossed the threshold of a legislature. And Florence Kelly was beyond savvy. She was, she, she was an amazing person. In the, in the 1880s, late 80s and early 90s, she was moving from state to state, working with union organizers to create um, better uh, laws for working people. And so she, and she published, she was a Marxist, she married a Russian immigrant, she was amazing. So she arrived at Hull House knowing how to do something that Adams was actually afraid to try, which was to lobby uh, a legislature. And so Kelly dragged Adams into child labor law activism at the state level. And it was Adams' baptism. Uh, and she was resistant because her father always said that he didn't want to be lobbied. <laughs> and so she thought lobbying was a bad thing, but Florence Kelly said, you're coming with me. <laughs> and um, off she went with some other uh, women's club leaders who were also experienced uh, organizers. And of course, she turned out to be fabulous at it and made it a lifetime career. But I'm not sure how fast she would have gone without Florence Kelly. And what about people like, oh, Ellen Starr and her personal, what we would call intimate relationships? She didn't marry, she didn't have children. Where did you find the love that way that's also foundational to empowerment? Yeah, Ellen said yes when Jane Adams said, I want to found a settlement house. And that meant the world. You know, you have a dream and you finally confess it to one person and they say, let's do it. That's amazing. So Adams was always grateful to Ellen Gates Stock for believing in her and believing in the project. Um, without hesitation, Ellen Gates Stock was a tremendous enthusiast for life. So that was crucial. Um, they were very close, dear friends. Uh, I think they, I know, they expected to spend the rest of their lives together, so it was a commitment that we today would call a partnership, a lifetime partnership. What happened was that, I mean, and people want to blame Adams for this, but I looked into LPA Star, and it's really not Adams' fault. They both felt ready to move on. Um, Ellen was impatient with Jane Adams' supreme tolerance of everyone and everybody. <laughs> she said, you know, if the devil was walking down Halstead Street, you'd admire his tail. <laughs> so, it just wasn't Ellen's way. Ellen was impatient, she was really judgmental, and it just, and of course, you're attracted to the opposite initially, and then you get, you have a tough time with it after a while. So, um, that was, there was really, you know, there was, I guess you could say, some tension uh, in the relationship. But Ellen was really eager to move on and have more love affairs. She, she had lots of really important intimate relationships in her life, men and women. And she just rests the spirit. And meanwhile, Jane had gotten to know a former student of Ellen's who volunteered at Hull House, Mary Rose Smith. And that grew into the lifetime partnership for Jane. And Mary Rose Smith's devotion to Hull House and to Jane Addams was lifetime and she funded Hull House, importantly, and so that was the place Adams went for the kind of love you can only get from someone who knows you well. Thank you, Louise. Uh, so, uh, I, do we need a microphone? Is, oh, you have one. But, so we now open the discussion. There, I see a couple of hands right there. Please identify yourself. I'm hardly in mic. Um, I'm uh, interested in Jane Adams having lots of the 
relationships with people and the women. But I'm interested in the women's networks, particularly the settlement house networks, and how she was involved in that and what that did for her. So just getting back to women's history, which also, of course, has to be with the larger context. <laughs> Um, so the question was about uh, the Settlement House Network and what, how I was involved and what it meant to her. So I, I, spent, I spent way too much time when I started researching Jane Addams. Oh, as a women's network, sorry. Well, the reason I misunderstood your question is that actually it wasn't just a women's effort. Uh, I mean, it was, there, was, there were certain settlements that women started, but and there were the College Settlement Association for the seven colleges, um, they were all women. But, uh, and I think Henry Street, was Henry Street all women? I can't remember. It started all women because it was all nurses. But it, I think it, it, it's not quite right to think of the settlement house movement as mainly a women's thing. Um, it certainly was crucial, maybe this is what you're getting at, um, for, for women who got involved in the settlement house movement, it was essential for them to explore life's options because, you know, in the early 20th century, what were their choices? Uh, and this is why Adams, what she felt herself and what she wanted for herself and to create for others. You know, what could women do? They could be teachers till they got married. They could be nurses if they, you know, wanted to go to a medical route, which not many people necessarily do. What was that? I mean, these women weren't even secretaries in the 1890s. Men were. So they could work as clerks in shops, which is on your feet all day, being super nice to everyone, which is very hard. So there is, there is, there, there are just no options, especially if you were bright, educated, ambitious, and really wanted to contribute to the world. What could you do? So the Settlement House Movement was a great draw for women, especially educated women. It got them away from their parents. It got them living independently, but safely, you know, in a settlement house. And then they could go out and learn about life, as Adams always said. So that's, I think, what you have in mind, right? Yeah, but there were many settlement houses that were co well, not many, they were co-ed, but there were many men's settlement houses, many, and then women's settlement houses. Adams founded the first co-ed settlement house. Um, there's a myth in the historical documentation that she really intended it to be a women's community, but she never did, I'm sorry to say. Um, however, she totally understood how important it was to women. Thank you. There was another question over there. Good. Yes, hi, I'm Meg Ma, I'm from Marlboro College. And um, I have a question, because this is a great title, a great conference, uh, Jane Adams at the time of crisis. Crisis is an interesting term. It's not something I would normally associate with Jane Adams' method which, as Louise mentioned, was tempered and thoughtful and reflective. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious what um, she might say to us now in terms of what, what's the moral energy we need to slow down, to work for the long game, not demand short-term responses. And um, the, the second part is, is, when does this train imagination? And how does it make us more humanist and less reactive? Well. Um, I'll take the second one first. Um, I had to do a lot of thinking about what Evans meant by trained imagination, and imagination was a very crucial concept. You see it in her, you know, famous quotations. And I think one way to get at it is to think about the fact that, or my opinion, that Jane Addams could have been the George Eliot of the United States. She had the makings of a novelist. Uh, she, and that's that ability to see things from lots of different perspectives. That's what novelists do. They inhabit completely different personalities and bring them alive and their viewpoints. Uh, and she was also interested, she actually adored George Eliot and read all of her novels and that was actually another important empowering influence because of um, Eliot's interest in fellowship, the idea of fellowship. So, I think what she meant by trained imagination was in a way what we gain when we really learn how to read novels well and read great novels. We become able to learn about different points. We suspend judgment. We say, all right, I'm going to be a murderer today. <laughs> I understand that the murderer has a point of view also. Um, and 
It, interestingly enough, there's a whole school of thought about the role of novels in teaching people to be able to imagine the world from points of view other than their own. Until the novel was invented, people didn't know how to do that in a sort of everyday way. Obviously, Christianity says, you know, the golden rule, which was an attempt to teach you that, but novels actually make you experience that. And some of the descriptions of people reading in the 18th century, you know, say, oh, they, they used to weep constantly while they read novels because they were so moved by living other people's lives. So um, I think that's what she meant. And in her case, what she meant was listen to people who you meet, try and understand, use your imagination to understand what they're thinking and feeling. And obviously, we failed, at, you know, we educated liberals have failed to do that with the people who voted for Trump. And, you know, we're instinctively resistant to wanting to do that, but that's wrong. She would say, you know, we have to understand what they're feeling. And that we really do. Um, and I think there's some conversation about that. You know, we, we failed to understand that before. And I think that's part of the crisis we're in um, because they have felt completely left out. There's you know, many other things going on there, but that's a piece of it. They don't feel, feel understood, and they, they say that. So, Thank you, Meg. Um, there is no pedagogy for empathy that I know being taught anywhere, so that's put them. Uh, there was another hand right up here. Hi, I'm Sandy Rinsted. I'm a social worker by profession. I'm inspired by Jehan when I was in sixth grade. I grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, <clears throat> what are your thoughts about jazz, about blacks, was this was not quite yet the most serious problem. Right. On the other hand, she was a co-founder, she was a colleague, a friend of W. Du Bois. Um, this is an issue of our times as well as then, and I'm going to be critic of, of Jane Addams because she didn't embrace, you know, so much of the social problems and what was going on in Chicago. She was in a different part of town where they were coming. So there were also the, the large African American migration north happened after World War One more or less. And right. she was more involved with international right. So that's that's sort of my, my question on that. Yeah. She sort of switch Yeah. You know <clears throat> you know, you can't do everything. And you know, so admiring what she did in Health House and so much of her, you know, her concepts of her work and labor and child laws came from that work. It was so important. Wish she'd been on the South Side as the Great Migration, but as you said, she switched her emphasis to the yeah. international piece. So yeah, so you're really asking, you know, what were Adam's views on the issue of Racism and African Americans, how did they change? What were the limitations of her understanding? What couldn't she escape from her own white inheritance? Um, I really tried to wrestle as honestly as I could with this issue um, and in the second book, which is when it really comes up. But I, I will note that when Hull House was founded, there was, I think it was 0.03% of the Chicago population was African American. This is 1889. So, you know, gradually, and especially after World War I, it really started to increase. So it wasn't looming large. There were the, there were a few. There were five African Americans who lived in the 19th Ward, and they lived over on the other side of the river um, from Hull House. African Americans were always welcome at Hull House. There's some erroneous scholarship that thinks that that was not the case, and I can explain why they misunderstood what was going on. But um, so they were always welcome there. But there were two things I would say. Um, one is she never understood white privilege. There, and that's a tough concept, and you know, a lot of us only understand it now because we were taught it by people who really were trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, and so, uh, for example, Hell House had the first African American resident uh, who was living at a settlement house that wasn't in a black community. And this was a woman named, I'm not going to figure her last name, Harriet, what? Harriet, I mean, whatever. What's her last name? We'll think of it. And um, I did an entry in Chicago, uh, there's an uh, uh, encyclopedia of Chicago women, and someone else was doing Jane Addams, so I thought, okay, I'm going to do this person, because I will have the chance to really dig into her history deeply in a way I could justify for the book. So I did, and, and Harriet was a remarkable woman. She grew up in Rhode Island, and her father had great connections to 
um, wealthy people took him his job, and so she got to go to Wellesley College, and one of the first black students there, got an MD degree, which Adams always thought she should get and never did, came to Hull House because it was an inexpensive place to live, but didn't want to practice among the poor. And there was racism among the immigrants towards her, she was black, uh, and she didn't want anything to do with the poor. She was climbing out of poverty, thank you very much. And then Adams and Julia Lathrop said, well, there's this new black hospital, Provident Hospital. We can set you up, you know, we know everyone there, you can go practice there. And she didn't want to. She didn't want to practice, as Adams would say, among her own people. Why? Because she was aiming for integration. She was aiming for being a regular middle class doctor with regular middle class, not necessarily black patients. And Adams never could understand that. So uh, she also didn't understand about the uh, lynching, the, the idea that the problem with lynching was, she thought what every, all white people thought, which was uh, the problem was they were breaking the law, but you shouldn't hang a person, you should go through the courts. And Ida B. Wells explained to Adams eventually, no, 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 these black men are not raping white women. That's a hoax. You know, sometimes they've done absolutely nothing at all, and then they're being lynched. So she, she didn't get that initially either. Um, and those are the main things I figured out as best I could. But she absolutely believed in social equality. She absolutely believed that African Americans were her social equals. And she, the older she got, the more she learned about racism. She didn't understand enough about it initially. Thank you. Again, reminding us of people as creatures and create as creatures of time as well as creators. I just got the three minute signal, so we can take maybe one more question and then we should uh, move into the break. Yes. Quick question. Louise, uh, are you going to benefit, or can you benefit, will you be benefiting from Kathy's work in any way? Oh, <laughs> I would have. <laughs> I really would have. I could have done it in my research in my pajamas instead of having to go to Brown University to look at the microfilm and get a cricket in my neck. I've written two books about Adams. I'm devoted to Adams always forever. I don't know how much more research I'll do on her. It's, it's quite possible I might decide someday. I mean, I have a million ideas of papers I never ate, wrote or essays I never published that I you know, would love to do. And in, if I do, I will be ever grateful to Kathy for the project. So thank you very much. And I hope many of you will come up to Louise and Kathy during the break with further questions that you may have and or later in the day during lunch. And now we're going to take a brief break. Uh, I think we're going to take a break. <laughs> Thank you, panel.